Good afternoon, Glory Church. Happy Sunday. It's really good to see you guys through the camera here for me. Um, I hope you guys had a great week. Welcome to Sunday service. At this time, uh, I just want to take this time to just prepare heart for the service for this quick moment here. Yeah, let's just first give thanksgiving for our Father, for He is good. So let's take some, uh, take some time to pray right now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and how you're here with us and how you're hearing our prayer and how you know our needs, God. And God, I just want to really pray for us, our church, your body here, that will not give up, Lord, that will continue to really seek you and we have our hope in you Lord Father so God give us the courage the boldness to really get through together Lord Father that we need you God you're so welcome in this place God bless us Father as we bless you Lord This time, I want to lead you guys in the time of um, Apostles' Creed. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, why don't you just greet one another saying, hey, happy Sunday in a chat group. If you're with your family or your uh, your sister or brother, let's say hi, greet one another, and let's worship.
seen a light. I have seen a light. Like the break of dawn, giving blind men sight, letting lame men work. I see a generation with resurrection light. We are a generation filled with the power of Christ and our soul.
in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Hold on to, hold on to your own as your triumph unfolds. He's never failing. He's never failing.
never failing It's 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 never failing Welcome, Glory. At this time, I want to lead us in a time of prayer. And before we do that, I want to read from Psalms, Psalm 119, verse 33. And it is the longest chapter in the Bible, but in verse 33 to verse 40, I want to really focus this prayer um, according to the scripture. And this is a psalmist really um, pleading and confessing and upholding the word of God. And this, in this section of this prayer, or this praise and adoration is in verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statues, and I shall keep it to the end. The psalmist really directs his prayer to God as a sustainer of his faith, of endurance of faith. He says, Lord, you are the one who teaches me. Teach me the way of your ways and your statues so that I can keep it to the very end. Verse 34, he says, give me the understanding. The understanding doesn't come within our own selves. The psalmist recognizes that the understanding of his statues and the word comes from God directly. He says, give me understanding, then I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. He's willing to give it his all. He's willing to bet his life on it as the Lord instructs him. Verse 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in your word. And he says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and rev revive me in your words. Isn't that powerful? His praise and prayer is turn my eyes. And in the literal translation, it says, cause my eyes to pass away. Look beyond the worthless things and allow your word to be revived in my heart. You know, as we meet this Sunday, I want us to pray that God's word would become the very treasure of our hearts again. As we're about to go into the word and listen to the sermon, I believe more than importance of the pastor preaching the sermon, it is our hearts that need to be ready for God's word to be planted, the seeds of the gospel to really be planted in the good soil. And this is the preparation of the psalmist. And he goes on to say, establish your word to your servants who is devoted to fearing you. He says, I'm willing to give my all and devote myself in really honoring you. He says, turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. You know, church, I want to invite us to take this time to pray together. I want us to pray and plead and really turn away from looking at worthless things. You know, and I will be the first one to confess here that during this quarantine, there's a lot of temptation for me to look at worthless things apart from God's word. And Rije and I had this conversation even right before I came to church today. And, and that is, as we are in God's word, it's so amazing. God brings simplicity back into our hearts. And Rije was just reminding me, honey, isn't it so wonderful that God's word brings such a simplicity and peace into our hearts? And that's what the Word of God does. It really brings clarity, a focus. And this is what the psalmist is praying for. Revive your Word in me. 
And I want to invite you into this prayer that we would turn away from worthless things, that it would cause us, the Word of God, our pursuit of God will cause us to look past beyond the worthless things of this world, that we would really focus in the most important, that we would treasure His Word in our hearts. And so would you join with me in this time of prayer? I want us to take this time to really earnestly seek. And um, we're going to just cry out the name of Jesus three times. And what we're going to do, if you, if you can, just get on your knees in a sign of surrender and a posture and your heart before God to say, God, all I desire is your word. All I want is you in this place. And so in the count of three, we're going to cry out the name of Jesus and we're going to pray. And after I cry out the name of Jesus, I'm going to get on my knees and pray with you. So let's do that in the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus! 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 Father, we pray, God, asking. We pray for your spirit, your word to be revived in our hearts, God. That in your church, Lord, that you would cause us to look beyond the worthless things of this life. That you would cause us to place our treasure in you and in your word and in your promises. Father, help us to let go of worthless things. Help us to turn our hearts away from the idols of our hearts. And Lord, really put you as the Lord of our lives. Father, we surrender our hearts again. We, we really surrender even our thoughts, our dreams, our desires, and even our comfort. And we say, Father, Yesterday, um, this is Saturday recording, but yesterday, Friday, was my 10th year anniversary with BJ, and we were able to simply just go to our backyard and renew our vows. Looking back 10 years of the vows that we spoke to one another, how we committed to one another through sick and through health, through rich and through poor, through the good and the bad that we will be willing to commit to one another. And it just kind of renewed and is settled again in my heart of God's faithfulness. And I got to experience in, in our family life as I'm looking at my bride and I'm saying, look, I'm gonna be focused on you. I'm gonna devote my life to you through good and the bad, sick and through health, through rich or poor, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna be focused on you. And it brought us clarity, a singular attention where I was able to look and be renewed and reminded, wow, I am so good in my life right now. And God reminds us in the same way as Jesus is our bridegroom. He says, you put your heart and focus on me. And all the wor worthless things in this world, it fades away, church. 
And I just want to encourage you guys that we would really be able to do that today as we prepare our hearts for God's word, that we will lay down our worries, that we will lay down the fear of what might happen in the future. But we will be very present with God through his word as we abide in his word, as we really devote ourselves to his word, that as we treasure his word today, that truly his word will bring life in you that his word will give you clarity and a desire and a passion where you will go to the ends of the earth to share the love of God. And this is my prayer for all of our church, even though we're separate and even though we're kind of going through this pruning, this kind of this process of being away in our homes, I believe this is God's doing where he is pruning the church He's refining the church, like refining the gold and the fire, and we're becoming purified. It's hard, it's, it, it's, it burns, but God's purifying us. And so Father, I pray that your word would again cleanse us and it would renew us, that it would really ground and empower us, that we would remain faithful as you are faithful. Lord, I pray that your word that is proclaimed today, that your word would not only come to us in our heads, but it would transform us. It would do away with the old. It would put away the lies. It would put away even the complacency and the laziness of our hearts. And revive us, O oh Lord. Revive the church, O oh Lord. May your word become life. May it bring joy. May it bring hope. And truly, may it give us our strength for today. So thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who is with us now. So Lord, thank you again for everything and all that you're going to do. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go into announcements, guys. Good afternoon, Glory LA. The following are announcements for this week. Start your morning with your Glory LA family as we seek, hear, and pray together Tuesdays and Fridays at 7 a.m. on Zoom. Deepen your understanding of God by learning and growing with your community Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. on Zoom. Allow us to support you in prayer during these challenging times. Submit your prayer request online through the Glory LA app. Subscribe to the Bible Reading Plan and let's read the entire Bible in two years together. Link is found on the Glory LA app. Interested in finding more about our family groups? Fill out your information on our Glory LA app. Tithings and offerings can be made through our Glory LA app. Submitting a prayer request is encouraged with your offering. Make sure to download our church app on your Google Play or App Store to stay connected. Type Glory Church LA on the search bar to download. Y'all ready? Leave the meeting. <laughs> All right, drop the beat, Rachel. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi, Glory LA fam. We hope everyone is safe and we hope to see y'all soon in person. Glory, we clearly suck at this as millennials, but we miss you guys and we love you guys. We miss you. Miss you. Miss you. We just wanted to come on today and encourage everybody to just continually um, stay strong through all of this and um, always remember that God is blessing us and that he's with us. So um, the, just a couple things I wanted to encourage you guys with is to always wait patiently, um, to have faith, to pray, to think of others, trust in the Lord, read, God wor read God's word and give thanks. Stay strong, everyone, and we love you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, just wanted to encourage you guys during this hard times. And just want to say that faith is not knowing that God can, but it's knowing that He will. So just trusting that he will give you more than what you asked for and that he will give you back better than what you lost. So everyone, hi team! Hi guys, I hope you're all doing well and hanging in there. 
I know it seems like this whole pandemic and just a stay at home order is dragging on um, and it feels like forever, but I hope that you guys aren't disheartened by it, um, but choose to continue to seek God in your homes or wherever you are and find comfort and hope in him. I know some of us are actually enjoying the stay at home order like me, but I know there are also a lot of people like even around me who are going through a lot and um, as a result of coronavirus. So I hope we can all be sensitive to the feelings of those people and just what they're experiencing and what they're going through. Um, and just be that light that they need in their life right now. So um, I hope that you guys will encourage them and talk to them and especially pray for them. So I wanna share a verse with you guys. Um, it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I know what um, is going on right now isn't light affliction and a lot of people are really suffering in different ways um, because of this virus. But if you really think about it, it really is light compared to the eternal rewards of heaven and um, what Jesus went through for us. So um, I hope that you guys will continue to be in prayer and I can't wait to see all of you guys. Love you. Bye. We love, we love you. you. We love you. <laughs>
Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you so much for who you are today, Lord. And Lord, we ask for more of you right now. It is you. You are the amazement, Lord. You are who we need to be amazed at. You are the object of our belief and love, Lord Father. We ask that you would come to life in our lives, Lord. Ready our hearts to receive. May our hearts be that good soil that as we plant that seed, Lord, that it would grow and grow 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, Lord. So I pray, God, that you would ready us continually, Lord, that your word would come to life, your gospel would come to life, and, Lord, that we would be doers of your word, lovers of your word. So we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the church. We thank you for who you are. May your faithfulness shine through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What or who are you amazed at? Now before we get into the message, I had a good conversation yesterday with Q, Pastor Q. And we were going over the overview of Luke and Acts. And he's going over Acts in his Friday. And the KM pastor were talking about Acts. And coming from Luke and going into Acts, we know that Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles or more, um, and my mind just went blank, but more, I guess, clearly it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So from Luke unto Acts, the whole overarching theme, the whole overarching message and ministry is you see Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, into the ministry of the Apostles, of the church. And you see Jesus Christ throughout his suffering, all his miracles, signs, and wonders, all of his healings, even the enduring power to walk the walk, to die in obedience on that shameful, dreadful cross, and the power that resurrected him. All of this was done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus ascended to the Father, the Holy Spirit rained down onto his people. And Acts is all about his people continuing on the ministry of Jesus Christ, or more so clearly, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's so encouraging. I want to encourage you today. We were just having a talk, talk with the praise team before we began as we were praying and settling our hearts. When I was meditating and thinking about the early church, the church that we're going through right now in Acts, and we compare uh, the church today, this church in Acts didn't have everything that we had, all the tools. They didn't even fully have the completed Bible. Today we have so much information, so much commentary, so many things that really support our Christian faith to have us understand and to move us to where we need to go. But a lot of the times I believe all of these information, all these things more so cause a distraction in our lives. Because when you see the church, man, they didn't have like a tenth of what we have today. Maybe not even close to all of the resources and tools that we have as a Christian. But what they had was the Holy Spirit. They relied heavily on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit got them to where they need to be, gifted them, empowered them to really be about Jesus Christ, gave them the strength to endure. We saw Stephen's life. The Holy Spirit, right before Stephen went through what he went through in persecution and death, God filled him with the Holy Spirit to give him the strength and the endurance to exactly personify Jesus Christ and his death. Even in death, he was able to bless his enemies. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And when you think about this, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that worked in Jesus Christ, the same Spirit that is working through Acts as we're going through the apostles of Paul, that same Spirit, same Lord is with us today. And for us to rely upon that same Spirit, the Spirit is with us today. Take courage, church. Have hope, church. God is still with us. The Holy Spirit is still moving and working. May we recognize the Spirit. So in the previous week, 
persecution caused the church to be scattered and dispersed. And as they were scattering and dispersed, persecution was a tool used to get the gospel out to Judea, to Samaria, and we'll see later on to the ends of the earth, to the rest of the Gentiles. Persecution caused many to have salvation. And we see the Holy Spirit using Philip to preach the gospel, working signs and miracles, causing much joy in the city he was in. Suffering leads to much joy in the Holy Spirit. Suffering brings much joy through the Holy Spirit. And persecution with joy in Christ brings salvation for the many. Now we see here in verses 9 through 13, an interesting character arises, Simon the magician, who declared himself to be someone great. He did these powers, and when you study him, either they, you know, a lot of the commentary in the study say that he did demonic powers. Whether it was through deception of the magic that we know today, or it was actually demonic power and true power of magic and sorcery and witchcraft, all the pe people were amazed at him. The people said he was the great power of God that is called great. And Simon declared himself to be great. And they were all amazed at what he was doing. And I love magic. And when I was kind of studying through Simon, the magician, um, I really liked magic. And I remember going to David Copperfield with Heidi. And I literally was watching this magic show by David Copperfield. And in the mid the middle of his show, I turned to Heidi and I said, I think he's demon possessed. There is no way that he could do what he was doing. It was just unexplainable. And I go, I, I really think he's demonic. Just side note, I like magic. But verses 9 to 13, when you see magic, you are beheld by amazement. It is amazing. And so you see this emphasis on amazement, amazement on Simon the magician, and even amazement on Simon to Philip. Simon was amazed by the power that Philip had, the amazement of signs and great miracles, the amazement. You got to see paralyzed people, lame people. These people were becoming healed. The true power of God was showing the power of the Holy Spirit will triumph any other power, no matter how demonic. And Simon saw something. Simon saw a power that was greater than his and made me think about what we're amazed at today. What are you amazed at, church? Just like Simon, are you amazed by power? Are you amazed by signs and wonders? Are you amazed through healings? Are you amazed at prophetic? Are you amazed through all the giftings of the Holy Spirit? Amazed through all the supernatural and the spiritual realms? I myself, and guilty of being fully engulfed in the amazement of these things, wanting these things, yearning these things, experiencing these things. And let's not lie, there's a piece of humanness in me, in all of us, that want a certain amount of power, a certain amount of attention through these things. But these things are not used to attract attention for ourselves. These things are not for our own gain. It is not for me and to make my kingdom great. The amazement of these things is to make us look at Jesus Christ. The reason why the Holy Spirit does these amazing, unexplainable gift things is for us to recognize that there is a higher power that there is God. The role of the Holy Spirit is always to point and glorify Jesus Christ. The elements of the Holy Spirit and the workings of the Spirit is always to point at Jesus Christ, not to ourselves. But because our hearts aren't right at times, even I'll say most times, it becomes about my own satisfaction. It becomes about fulfilling myself. And all the things that we're amazed at distracts us from what we truly should be amazed at. That is Jesus Christ. It is God the Father. It is the Holy Spirit. But we always look at the things that are the byproduct. And when we look at the world today, we get amazed by great pastors, great speakers, great worship band, big churches, big stages, all the lights, all the big tent revivals. 
And I notice even for myself, we talk sometimes more about these things and the elements of the church and the byproduct of the church, the byproduct of a Christian life more than the master and the one who produces all these things. Simon was amazed at the power rather than the one who provided that power because he wanted it for himself. And even Luke, we see that Simon believed. He even got baptized. Whether he truly believed or not is open-ended. When you study the historians from Justin to Irenaeus, they talk about in Samaria, this exact Simon the magician who went on to continue on his heresy. There's rumors that he founded Gnosticism. But whether he believed or not, we do these same things. We do all these Christian, right Christian things, right Christian rituals, right Christian traditions to receive Christian blessings. We do this all the time. And so what makes me, what it led me to, is that as we are amazed by these things, amazed by the byproduct of our Christian lives, amazed by the byproduct of the Holy Spirit moving, Jesus Christ accomplished work on the cross, what becomes the center of my believing? What becomes the object of your belief? And for Simon, it was about power. He wanted to obtain this power because he was about his own greatness. What is yours? What is your center of believing? What is your object of belief? Is it blessings? Is it for your prosperity? Is it even security and salvation to know that you're good, to give you that blanket of security in your life, to know that even after, to give you that good feeling to know, okay, I'll be taken care of even after death. Even righteousness. Is it about righteousness? Is it about your own righteousness to make things always right? Is it about healing? Is it about peace? Do you yearn and crave for power and want power? Is it about joy? Is it about your own fame? About your own glory? Is it about your fulfillment? Now don't get me wrong, these are all elements God uses to bless us in our lives to look at Christ, but it must be used to avert our eyes upward to Jesus. But when it becomes only about these things, it becomes very fast, very quickly into self-satisfying measures. We're always coming into the church, even the setting of worship, and we're here to receive. What do you have for me, Lord? Bless me today. What is it that I can gain from worship? What is it I could gain from the message? If I can't gain anything, everything becomes whack. We complain. We're never satisfied even in our Christian lives. It's crazy because Jesus Christ says he gives you that living water so that you may never thirst again. He says, come and eat from me so that you may never hunger again. But why as a Christian are we never satisfied? Why are we never content? Why are we never fulfilled when we should have Jesus Christ? And I believe we're never satisfied even in our Christian lives because instead of seeking Christ, we seek out the products of Christ, the side effects, the byproducts of our Christian living. The product of Christianity, the product of Jesus Christ, the byproducts of the Holy Spirit was never intended to satisfy you. These works were intended to lead you to the one who can satisfy you. That is Jesus. But a lot of the times we just want the byproduct of Christianity. We want joy. We want peace in our lives. We do want the blessing. We want prosperity. We want security. We want love and to be loved. We want all the nice things that Christianity brings, Jesus brings. But at the same time, for some reason, we leave Jesus Christ out. Because when we think about Jesus and what comes with Jesus Christ, there comes submission. There comes an element of suffering. There comes an element of dying to yourself and your flesh, to your own desires. He says, if you don't hate your mother or father or yourself, you're not worthy of me. There's the element of picking up my cross. There's all these elements that we think of that we just don't want. But we don't understand that he 
is the blessing. It is he that all the source of blessing, of joy, of security, of peace, of goodness, of kindness, of all the things that we are yearning for comes from. It is coming from him. That's why in Christ we will never thirst. In Christ we will never hunger again. In Christ we are content and satisfied. You know, I always used to um, kind of make fun of this one saying, Jesus is the answer when I was younger. Jesus is the answer. Everyone used to just say, Jesus is the answer. And I would think, how is Jesus the answer to like people's poverty? And how is Jesus the answer to all these elements of social like, you know, breakdowns and unfairness? But one thing that, that's funny is um, even in searching for my own contentment in life, and through my own, I was never in poverty, but in poorness. I was never like poor, but I said, Jesus, how can you come and be the answer to someone's poverty when they're yearning for so much, when there's so much lack? But it's crazy. When Jesus Christ arrives on that scene in someone's poverty-stricken state, Jesus makes them see the element of who he is and he comes and he does feel all in all and he brings satisfaction and contentment because the yearning and the wanting for more things becomes subsided and it dies because Jesus becomes the everything Jesus becomes the all so even in our lives when we see that we do not have all of these things and we're constantly searching and yearning and thinking I don't have enough money for this I don't have enough for this when Jesus Christ comes into the picture he becomes everything there's no more wanting yearning searching after we find fulfillment because we have everything we need in Jesus Christ. And this is where I want us to be, church. This is where I want us to head, church, that in Jesus Christ, that we are good. That I am fully satisfied. That through the Holy Spirit, I have everything that we need. That there is no lack. And I was actually telling this to the praise team, how much, you know, I don't know if God's heart, like, he gets, you know, um, mau ma po. His heart gets saddened. But as a Christian, when we live out our Christian lives and we're constantly looking at our own lack and we're always complaining about the lack in our lives, how much it would break God's heart when God is fully in the picture in your life and he is saying, I am right here. I gave you my son. My son came to die, to suffer, to resurrect, to show you how much I love you. And you sit here complaining about all of the lack in your life. How much that would pain God's heart. God has given us everything. He's given us his son. He's given us his spirit. God says, what more would I not give you? I gave you my everything. Church, we are not in lack. God is dwelling with us right now. And it's funny, in John 6, 26, this is how fickle we are. This is how easily pleased we are. This is how easily we will uh, chase after the temporary things in our lives and be so satisfied with these little things instead of going into the deeper need. And this is what Jesus says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. This is after he fed the 5,000. He says, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. So there's something that people crave after more than signs. He says, but because you ate your fill of loaves. I come to you, Jesus, because you filled my stomach. People, we cannot be so easily satisfied with this life to forego our seeking of Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ alone and just to have my stomach filled, just to be amazed, just to have my senses aroused. John 2, 23, 25 says this. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. 
They saw the signs. They were amazed at Jesus and they believed. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. And when you study this, it was that he knew that their faith was shallow and set upon only the things that he did, but not who he was. They could not recognize fully who Jesus Christ was. And when our faith and our believing are set on these things of, sh of the exterior and the byproduct and we never go deep into who Jesus is and set ourselves to cling to God, our faith stays shallow. And I was thinking about this and even in my own life and I came up with this quote. I like this quote. We're often chasing after products and the byproducts of Christianity rather than the one producing it. As people, we're so content with these little things to just make us cope. Life is hard. There's stresses. There's so many things I want, so many things I need to achieve. There's the burdens of this, of family, of work, of just future, of just there's so many unknowns and so many variables in life. That's why a lot of people do drugs. It helps you cope with life to get you to the next day, to get you to the next moment. And we use Christianity to have it be an aid for me to just cope with what I'm going through. I just need to get to that next stage in life. And I just need Christianity to give me that extra joy and strength, the strength to endure. I just need that peace of mind to get me through. I just need a uh, community and love and all these other elements. No, what we need is Jesus Christ who fulfills these elements in our lives. And again, we are never fully content and satisfied because we're just so happy staying with just these elements of Christianity more than the one who is Christianity, Jesus Christ. And we need to dig so much deeper into the root of who Jesus is. We must stand on the foundation of him and him alone. And this is what it says in Mark 4, 16, 17. And we were going over last week the four soils. And this is the soil that we tend to sometimes be at too. And there are the ones sown on rock ground, the ones who when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy. They hear it and they get so excited by it and they have no root in themselves but endure for a little while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word immediately they fall away. How many of us are like this? We get amazed and we erupt with joy for all these things that we receive, blessings and this warm, fuzzy feeling of his presence. And then we go on about our day, never setting ourselves to cling to Jesus Christ. And when hardship arises in our lives, we abandon faith so easily. We abandon Jesus Christ so easily. We can't endure through a little bit to hope in him, for him to come through and shine in our lives, to have him show us that he is here. He is divine. We are the branches. He needs to be the source, church. There are no shortcuts to building relationship. No shortcuts. We need to spend time with him. We need to choose to love him over all things we need to choose to spend so much time with him you must turn off your tv your computer your xbox your playstation your switch gary your phone spend time with debbie spend time in the world with the lord i'm just picking on gary but in all seriousness we must choose every day to battle and fight for Christ in all our decisions. I will, I'm with you, church. A lot of the times when I have a stressful day and when I'm here all day and I go to church and I just want to veg out, the last thing on my mind is to engage with even my own wife. We have these talks. She misses me all day. When I get home, she wants to engage. She wants to see how I am doing. She wants me to ask how she's been doing, how I miss her. But when I get to my house, all I want to do is turn my brain off and watch Netflix. And so when she's trying to engage with me, I'm like, babe, I'm trying to veg. 
I need some time. And I choose to love other things more than her. It's the same with Christ. We show how much we love our, our, our dear family, our wives, our companions, and Christ by what we choose to do. Either we will choose him or we will choose to love something else. And we often choose to love something else. And that usually is me. And this is so important why we need to spend time with Jesus Christ. All the elements that Jesus teaches us to live out, all his commandments, all of the love, all of the forgiveness, all the elements of patience and long-suffering, all the characteristics that Jesus Christ exudes out of his personhood, it only comes from a deep relationship with him. I'll say this again. All these things come from a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. I guarantee you, when you just try to look at the word with no relationship with Jesus Christ, and you look at what he tells you to do and how you should love someone radically, and you just try to do these things, sooner or later, which is sooner, you will fail miserably. You will get frustrated easily. You will get irritated. You will get annoyed. And you will abandon loving someone the way Jesus wants you to love so quickly. But when you are in that fellowship with Jesus, when you are in that fellowship with the Holy Spirit, look, this is the acts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers you with his character to have joy in situations, to love when you cannot love, to be long-suffering and patient and kind when you cannot. The Holy Spirit fills you to empower you to shine the beauty of Christ in situations that you have no power in, just like Stephen. To love your enemy when your enemy is hell-bent on killing you. To say to the Father, to say to the Lord, and to look to him and say, please forgive them. Forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. And in the midst of your own suffering, you can proclaim blessings upon your enemies. It is through a deep fellowship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And church, it's going to take time. Relationship with Christ, it is not easy. It is enduring. All these things we self-gratify from, we tend to fall into these things because why? It's so easy to receive these instant gratifications. But with Christ... It takes patience, it takes faith, it takes time, it takes believing, it takes enduring. But I guarantee you, it is worth it when Jesus Christ and his presence comes and the Holy Spirit fills your life to empower you to live this life. It is worth it, church. And in that moment, you will understand that it is Jesus who is filling you with that living water to never thirst so that you will find satisfaction in him. We'll find that our hearts aren't right before the Lord when we're only after gaining for ourselves. And I'm not trying to keep pushing this, but church, when we come in front of the presence of God and we're always con constantly just wanting and wanting and wanting and gaining and gaining, that is of the flesh. Because the Holy Spirit is about us giving it is about us serving it is about us loving it is about us seeing the need of the other but when you come into this place yearning and yearning wanting taking taking our hearts there is something that we need to work out and even for simon he tried to pay for the power of the holy spirit to use it for his own gain First off, I want to teach you that you cannot manipulate and use the Spirit however you please. And this is what Simon wanted with the Holy Spirit. This is what he was craving for. He was, I'll pay for the power that you have in giving the power to these people by the laying on of your hands. I'll pay for it so I could have that power too and do with the power as I please. A lot of us might not have the same mentality to pay for this power, but we sure do have the same mentality of manipulating and using the Spirit like He's our tool. Like He's at my command. Holy Spirit, do this. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit. No. 
The Holy Spirit is God, and he does as he pleases. We are the vessel. We are the tools, and we do as he says. And the gift that is given through the Holy Spirit was by the cost of Jesus, his own life, his shed blood, and his death. There is no amount of money that could pay for this. His worth, the life of Jesus, there is nothing that could amount to this worth. And let's not cheapen grace and his grace that he bestows on us by pursuing the things of Christ for my own gain. Let us not cheapen the life of God by pursuing me and my kingdom. I want to honor Christ by what he did, by pursuing after what he wants. There's actually um, a term called simony that developed from this actual story from Simon the Magician. When anyone practices this evil practice of obtaining positions in the church for power, by paying a price or offering a bribe, it's called simony. And it's from this. Simon needed to find repentance and be amazed at the work of the cross through Jesus Christ. But he found amazement in his own self and amazement in the power that he wanted to obtain. And a lot of us do this in the church today. It is such a sad story. But we use and obtain power for my own glory to move up the ranks and to have power over people. But the power that God bestows on us is for me to be last, for me to be on the bottom so that I would lift up and serve my people. Can we get the praise team? And you see always these two conflicting battles of the flesh and the spirit. Even with Stephen's story, you see Stephen full of the spirit, humbly taking upon death and lifting up even his enemies to bless them. And you see the other side of the flesh and of evil and wickedness of these Pharisees, Sadducees, these religious elites who want to tear Stephen apart and they kill him. And you even see here with Philip and you even with Simon, these two conflicting sides, one is about gaining for himself, the other is going through suffering and persecution to go and be a blessing to this other city, especially Samaria. When religion is used, and I got this quote from my studies, when religion is used to make its leaders seem great and powerful, and whenever religion becomes a commodity by serving the interests of those who have or want money, it has become corrupt. We are not about greatness, church. We're not about my greatness. We are not about the greatness of the people. We are about the greatness of Jesus Christ. Simon was about his own greatness, about what he could gain. He wanted power and obtain power for himself to build his kingdom. He was called great and declared great and the power of God by the people. But the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, through Philip, through these deacons, are always declaring the glory and the greatness of Jesus. And I love this. From the book I'm reading again, The Making of a Man. The Making of a Man of God. I highly recommend men you read it, The Life of David, and it dissects his life. And this is actually something I prayed when I received God in YWAM. And when I beheld his glory, I was like, God, I don't need anything else. I don't need your blessings. All I want is you because he is that blessing. And the author is going through this journey of when David comes back from his son Absalom, when Absalom took upon the throne and was after David and trying to kill his own father to take that throne. And he comes back into his kingdom and he comes back to his throne. And there's this son of Jonathan that he bestowed a lot of blessing and grace to, Mephibosheth. And before he meets him, Ziba, his servant, comes out and he says, this guy abandoned you. He took off. And so he gives all of the land that he bestowed upon him to his servant. And as he's 
going to his throne, Mephibosheth comes into the picture and he's raggedy. He is raggedy. He didn't get a haircut. He wasn't wearing any shoes. His feet were dirty. His nails were long. Everything was growing out. And he was like, where were you? Because Ziba told a lie and slandered Mephibosheth. And he comes and he goes, I was waiting for you. I was waiting for the king. And he was in abstinence. He was in mourning. He was in sorrow until David came back. And then David said, you know what? I'll bestow half of the land back to you. And you know what he says? He goes, I don't need that land. I am so content with you coming back in peace that you may have your house again. So the author is going through these words that we should behold in our lives. And one of them was abstinence. And the second one is abandonment. And I love this. And he says this, the second word is abandonment. Let him take all, David. I am not interested in the land. What matters to me more than anything is that you have come again in peace to your own house. All I want is you. Not your blessings or your wealth or possessions, but yourself. This is the response which grace merits. One of the evidences that grace has been genuine in a man's life is that there is something about him of abstinence. Something about his character, his speech, his behavior, his dress that indicates he shares in the suffering and rejection of Christ until he comes again. Deeper even than the outward signs, however, is the transaction about which the world knows nothing. Although it will see evidence of its reality in his life that come when he lifts up his face to the Lord Jesus and says, Lord, I am not interested in your blessings. All I want is that you should reign in peace in your own house. Let them take all the material things, Lord. But I am yours. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am your blood-bought child, Lord Jesus. And therefore, I belong to you completely. This is the attitude and the character I want for us to have, church. That we would forego and forsake all things just to have Jesus Christ, just to have the Holy Spirit. What are you amazed at, church? Are you amazed at all these wonderful things in life and the byproduct of what Christianity and Jesus can give you? Or are you amazed at Jesus himself, at the Holy Spirit himself, at God the Father himself? What are you amazed at? And I pray that our amazement would come from Christ and the work of the cross and that it would deepen that grace would unfold and deepen in our lives, church, that we would be about Jesus Christ and his glory alone. Let's pray. As we pray, um, I want to lead us again into a time in applying the word into our lives. And I really believe it's so timely because even on Wednesday night as we were going over Genesis, we went over the same theme of learning to embrace God's dream. And in light of that, it really addressed the element of learning to let go of our past and experiencing true freedom and taking hold of what God has for us. And I really believe this contrast, the picture is depicted in the Simon, uh, in the life of Simon, where he is unwilling to let go of his bitterness and his, his love for sin. And whereas Philip, he is so, he's kind of fleeting. He's in persecution, he's going, but yet he's still so set on the, sh on giving and sharing the gospel, which he so freely received. And I want to throw this out there for us in this prayer, and that is, are you truly free in God's grace? And if you are, freedom should allow us to really let go of the things that really provide security or even up to this point have defined who we are. 
freedom is that we have Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that's pretty much saying because we are the redeemed and because the Spirit of God is now with us, reviving us and giving us new life, we no longer are bound by anything in this world. And that's true freedom. And as I am reflecting even in the life of Simon, as I'm looking here, what's interesting that you see Philip pointing out, being filled with the Holy Spirit, Philip says to Simon in Acts 8.23, he says, look, I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. He says, your heart is so wrong. You can't receive this. You can't buy this. You can't objectify the power and the gift of God because your heart is wicked. It's poisoned by bitterness. It's poisoned with your love for sin. Isn't that such a good insight for us to really see and consider in our own lives? Because when there is bitterness or sin that is hidden inside of our hearts, we cannot truly fully grasp the gift of God or the things of God. And just like Simon, all we're going to do is we're going to try to cover it up with obtaining greater power or on the shallowness, on the outside, it will look like power and all these cool things. But deep inside, the depths of your heart never gets addressed. It cannot penetrate. And that's the reality of Simon here. We are seeing that Simon is not willing to let go of his bitterness. He's not willing to let go of sin. And he's always willing to cover up his tracks with outside things, shallow things, worthless things. But God is calling us to turn from our ways, receive grace, this kindness, the favor, the blessing. And when we receive it, we truly could be focused, just like Ms. Vivoshev was. He says to David, all I want is to sit at your table. And you know what? He got to do that for the rest of his life. He got to sit at the king's table and eat with the king every single day. And that's like Psalm 27. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I would seek. One thing, singular thing that I would dwell in your house all the days of my life. See, people who have received such kindness understand that there is nothing in this world, not even family, that can compare to the goodness of our King. This is a progression. It's not going to just happen instantaneously. It is a daily renewal and it is a daily transformation as we Behold the beauty of God. And so could I lead you into this time of prayer where we can lay down our bitterness, where we can lay down and, and really identify the sin, the fear, the unwillingness, the objects that we're not willing to let go, that we're so holding on dear tightly and we're saying, no, 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 no. God, this is something that you gave. I cannot let them go. You know, as a parent, I don't think I could ever let go of Nora or Isaiah, right? But when in, in light of God, I could let, let them go to God. It's not an easy statement, and I'm not just saying it, but I've thought about this. I'm able to let it go to God and entrust them in God's hands because God knows better than I. And it's the same manner. A lot of times we're like, no, 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 I can't. This is mine. No, 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 you gave it to me. I must hold on to it with my dear life. But God says, no, I'm bigger. Even those things, it's hidden, underlining in our hearts where we're seeking security and identity outside of Christ. And I want to just take this time where we can take a moment where we can just come before the Lord and say, Father, search me and know me. Search me and know me. And when he reveals things in your life, the fears, the insecurities, the hurt, that you will be able to identify it and say, I lay it at your feet, Jesus. Let's turn from our old ways 
and let's look to our King who is so compassionate, who is slow to anger, who is so merciful and kind. Let's take this time to pray that prayer, shall we, in our own place, in our own hearts, that we would really come and just ask the Lord to search us and let's lay it down before the King now. As we read in Psalm 119, as the word takes precedence in our hearts, help us to see beyond the worthless things and see the beauty of God in his word. You know, I, I thought it was so fitting, even with today's message, that as Philip was so set, he was so set on what Christ had done in his life. And yet, Simon, this mystic or this kind of this spiritual dude, guru, he, he missed the whole part altogether. And I, I really want to encourage you guys that this week that you would really consider and, and struggle with the reality of learning to let go and take holding of God. Because he is faithful. He's with you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. And I pray that you will continue to pray with the church this week. That you will continue to pray not only for Glory Church, but for the church in the entire world. That we will continue to shine God's light. That we wouldn't look to save our lives. That we as a church wouldn't seek our own rights. But Lord, that we would truly give our rights for the sake of the gospel for the sake of the other, that we will be willing to give generously with cheerful hearts, knowing God has even greater things. And I want to encourage you guys to continue to pray with us. This is a special time and a unique time in, a, in, in our history as mankind, that we will continue to be vibrant, alive, full of joy, as God's church. And so I encourage you guys to keep praying with us. And um, if you have any kind of prayer requests, you could ask for prayers, even in the chat room now. You could request for prayers and the pastors and the leaders were willing to pray with you one-on-one. -on -one. So even in the chat room, you could ask for more prayers and, and, and we can connect with you in that level. And I wanna encourage you guys as we go into a time of offering, I know it's a hard time, but may you give out of faith. I'm not gonna tell you how much you are to give. That's something that you and God need to work out. But for me, what I wanna instruct you is be a cheerful giver and give ungrudgingly with joy in your hearts. 
And so let's give our offerings and our tithings to the Lord. Obviously, you know, it's through our app or you can text um, the text messaging. It's in the information. You can do that. You can text to give. And so let's take this time to have offering. sermon let's respond in the praise let us declare our God's faithfulness and knowing that the spirit is in us that he will never leave us or will never fail us that we'll continue to praise his great faithfulness as a body for us to really give all our hearts to him because he is enough, he is more than enough. So church, let's respond in praise.
as we um, close in this service, may you guys take heart. Because even though we're struggling, guess who's greater? Even when our heart fails us, take heart why Jesus is greater than our hearts. Jesus is able. He is able to do the impossible. And all he's willing for us to do is that we would step into that reality, that we would step forward into the place of the water, and he will hold you up. So don't, don't just stay put. This week, I want to encourage you guys, even if it's a small act, that you would act in faith, that you would open up and walk into the opportunities and see God move through your life. Why? Because he's with you. He is with you, and he is our treasure. He is our joy, our source of our life. And so may you guys continue to strive towards loving on him and finding beauty in him that you would make it about a singular commitment, a desire, one thing I desire of the Lord that I would seek, that I would dwell with him all the days of my life. May that truly be your prayer. And let us pray together as we close this service. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being so gracious and so kind that even when we fail, you remain faithful to even correct our ways, to really empower us again, to lift our heads again, that we would see greater things than what we see in ourselves. Father, give us the strength and give us the hope that we would see beyond and past the worthless things in this world that we would continue that we would cease to cover up our own tracks of our own bitterness and our own struggles in our hearts but lord that we would take hold of the gospel your forgiveness of sins and the hope of the resurrection of our bodies and so now we pray that you would truly empower the church that we would shine your light to the ends of the earth, that we would continue to extend our hands to our neighbors, and Lord, that you would use us for your glory. This benediction is from Jude. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power and authority are his before all time and in the present and even to eternity amen and all god's people said amen god bless you guys have a great week and we would love to chat with you even on the chat platform so meet you there and i hope you guys have a victorious week god bless you guys